Uh, it's not quite finished. Um, so it, the brilliance of doing a mock-up is that I realised how long this is going to take. So I'm going to break this into two sections as I did with the uh, owl. Uh, today we're going to get a background completed. Um, we'll get possibly uh, the butterfly started and uh, you'll definitely need a hairdryer today because in order to progress this through the stages there's lots of allowing it to dry particularly when we're putting pen on watercolor so if you have a hair dryer handy that would be um, really helpful today um, this is the sections on the butterfly here I'm just gonna put a little closer to the camera for a second those sections were removed with a stencil and uh, you can actually buy lots of stencils. I own lots of them. They're just pure fun. And um, the beauty, though, of making your own is that, firstly, it's your art, no one else's art. Hi, hi, Fan. How are you? Um, and the other beauty of it is that when you make your own stencil, you make it to fit your shape, your size. And I'm going to show you how to do it. Uh, today we're using I'm going to be using a piece of acetate but anyone could use an old x-ray um, am I showing my age if I say that because <laughs> these days if you go and have an x-ray they don't give you all those um, those films anymore or film as my nana used to say uh, they just give it to you on a cd or they email it to you gp or that kind of stuff so I'm using acetate and I'll give you a few options for the acetate as well. Hi, Deb. Good morning. Thanks for joining. So um, I, as always, put the supplies list, the reference. That's what I'm going to talk about first. This reference I, as always, put on my Facebook page, Marion Chapman Art of Sydney, if you're searching for it. I'm going to zoom in a little bit while I go through my pile of stuff. I want to talk about the um, order in which we're going to do all of this stuff today. I want to talk about the reference. But if you don't have that reference, I'm going to be using the easy how to draw uh, method from this book. So you'll be really easily able to work it out um, as we go along if you weren't able to get this reference. It's from Pinterest. It is not a royalty-free image. So I want to mention mediastorehouse.com.au, you can go and actually purchase this magnificent picture. The other thing about using someone else's reference, particularly since it's not royalty free, is that we need to change it. Um, I don't know, is the um, percentage 50%? Someone might like to comment on the um, law <laughs> about um, royalty. Hey, Amanda, good morning. So that's the image that I worked from. And uh, you can see that I used this magnificent S shape. And then I've altered the butterfly a fair bit um, by altering its angle. And of course, we're doing a watercolor. Um, and I'm, I haven't changed it overly dramatically. If you want to completely, uh, like if you wanted to sell this painting, you might consider editing it, not editing, changing the design a little more dramatically than that. Okay, that's that one. Oh, that's another reference. You'll find that one on my Pinterest. I didn't pin that one as well. But you can, the reason why I'm showing you this is you can go and find, it's from a website called 123RF, and the RF stands for royalty free. So you can find this image, um, uh, a royalty free version if you wanted to use royalty free and I think as artists we need to be super um, conscious of always acknowledging the work that we might have um, copied or referenced or and that's why I wanted to particularly point out mediastorehouse.com.au. Um, it's an Australian site so that was kind of cool and it's an Australian butterfly. It's also called Papilio Ulysses rather cool. Uh, yeah, so I've mentioned that. That's where I pinned my Pinterest image on Marion Chapman Artist Sydney. So that's where I try and put the resources that I'm going to be using, the supplies that we'll need today for the swallowtail butterfly. And in particular, it's a blue, a mountain blue swallowtail butterfly. Very, very specific. Watercolour paper paint, as usual, definitely a spray bottle today. The image, if you want, or... Um, if you want to just wing it when I start drawing it, 
then um, it's really awesome, easy method using that book from Drawing Made Easy. I did a, a video where I reviewed this book in and made specific re reference to the butterfly page. You can also find that on Pinterest if you didn't want to buy the book. We're definitely going to be using today, and we won't get up to that much of it. It might be next week that we do the black marker. I've got a few here. Um, oh, I just realized I've got another light to turn on. That's a bit brighter, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> it's funny how I was sitting here thinking, it's just a little darker than usual. <laughs> so for the bottom half, I'll just move some of these pages out of the way. For the flowers on the bottom, I just used a pen. This is just an ordinary um, black pen. Uh, it, the brand says EXP. It's a roller tip. I absolutely love this one, but I equally like this one too. And the brand, I'd love to tell you, but I can't. Oh, there it is. It's something on the handle. Super 8, possibly. I've got my glasses on, but you'd, you'd think I could read that text, but never mind. So this is the brush pen that I referred to in the uh, supplies list that I put on Facebook, and I put it in the description for today's live stream as well. So this is what a brush tip looks like. There's one, um, two, look at this handle. Isn't that beautiful? I actually bought them in Japan, and that's why they've got those beautiful flowers. Uh, unfortunately, it's nearly at the end because I've enjoyed that for years this is a Tombow black pen. Great brand, Tombow. Really beautiful quality pens. Um, and uh, it's water-based, so I think that one is water-soluble. Oh, yes, it is, because I used it up here when this edge of the wing was slightly damp. And you can see I've gotten that furry edge. I could have waited till it was dry if I wanted a hard edge. I love the opportunity for a furry edge. Oh, and there's one other brand here, which I use a fair bit as well. It's called Art and Fly. I got these on um, Amazon. It was uh, very, very reasonable. I'm just going to recap them because I love these pens. I think the brush tip um, makes it feel a little more, I don't know, arty. I'm not sure. So as I say, we'll definitely need, you'll definitely need a pen this morning, if you like this pen look, of course, at any stage, you change anything that uh, you want to because this is art. And I've used a much thicker marker up the top, water-based, because and that's how I got the fuzzy edge. So that's the markers. Now, how am I going through the list here? I'm going to show you what they're like. Uh, paint, spray bottle, the image, If or don't worry, I'll show you, black pen, marker. So the acetate and the x-ray, I'm not sure whether we'll actually get up to that today because the beauty of doing a mock-up is that I realised that this took me an hour and a half and I hadn't quite finished. And that's me having made all those decisions in advance, no talking, and um, then start. So it's at least a two-hour project minimum. So we'll get probably, um, we'll definitely get the black pen done on the flowers. We'll get the background done, background done. We'll probably get these flowers done and we'll begin on the butterfly. Oops, begin on the butterfly, but I'm not sure we'll get up to this stage of um, doing the remove. So that might give some of you a little bit of leeway to get some acetate and um, cut it up. That's, or as I mentioned, x-ray film, or you might have like a, something like this. You know, you get these um, plastic envelopes from Officeworks and you put pretty stuff in it. I'm going to show you these in a second. Uh, so anything plasticky like that. And the acetate, in fact, that I use are from those folders. You know, when you were caught, um, attend courses or um, if you're in the corporate world, you get those booklets um, and they have a plastic front. I tear them off and keep them. That's acetate. And that's actually what I'm using today. You need a blade. So that maps probably next week, probably next week. Hair dryer, definitely today and definitely next week. So that's the supplies. This is the order in which I, uh, we're going to do it. Now, usually uh, composition would be number one. But if you're working from this image, just trying to find it again. One second. This one. 
if you're working from this image like I did, the composition is um, pretty much done for you. Um, and the composition that it uses is the S design. Uh, and um, I'll just bring this painting back to show you the bottom half up and up to the butterfly. So it, it curves around, whether you call it an S or a Z or a back to front S or, or a, it doesn't matter. The idea is it, that it's a compositional uh, feature that you lead your eye in and up and you, you take the viewer on a lovely slow journey rather than into your subject. You take them on a lovely circuitous journey so that they ideally spend longer within your painting. And I find that in great paintings, they take you on some sort of wonderful journey, particularly in uh, landscape. Uh, there's lots of features in landscape that do a version of that. It's just a, a different version. And I think the key is to not make it too obvious to the viewer what you've done and uh, kind of obfuscate it a little bit, just a little bit. Right. The that's why I was talking about uh, colour being, that's why I was going to talk about colour being first. Normally for me, composition is number one. But today, because the, I'm following this composition, because I've already decided on it, I'm going to make the colour discussion number one because then we can get a background, show you that again, get the background down and that can begin to dry while we start the um drawing and transfer then we're going to glaze part of what makes watercolor so beautiful is that you can glaze one color on top of another and create new colors so if i zoom in on a beautiful section down here you get all this beautiful complexity so i've glazed in some yellow and that purple was glazed in over an orange background i'm going to show you how to do all of that that's, that's surprisingly easy to do um, if we do it in small sections. Hey, Bromland, good morning. Um, the transfer method will be the same one that we used last week. So that involved, just going through my little pile of stuff here. Last week, we used bank paper, or you might have used transfer paper. And if you didn't have any of those, then you used just a piece of paper, or some of you drew, um, I recall, I think Jean um, drew her design straight on. You can do anything that you want, always just work out ways around it. I think that's part of being very arty is that you get creative in your problem solutions, problem solving, I mean. Okay, here's the butterfly that I drew using the method from um, Drawing Made Easy, that book, but I've given it these significant tails that. That's why it's called the swallow tail. It's got these little tails on it. Then I added a bit of pastel and that allowed me to transfer it onto the page. The other thing that this was awesome for was I used it twice, not only to transfer my design, but then I used it. Can you see I've drawn these bits in? I was able to use that when it came time to do the um, stencil making. So and I'm going to show you all of those bits and pieces when I get up to that. Let's get rid of that one. Oh, that's my Stanley knife for probably next week. We'll see. Um, a pen I've mentioned and a marker. And, of course, if you don't have a marker, then use black watercolour paint or use dark watercolour paint or don't use black. There's lots and lots of ways around it. There's no you have to have this. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is start with colour. But just before we get into that, I think I've mentioned that book. And oh, I wanted to just make a little point, which is that when I began, I found composition the most challenging part of painting. I think working out uh, the techniques of watercolour is um, one area. But for me, composition just did not come easily. Hi, Myrna, how are you? And um, what I focused on instead was colour. And so it was really cool and I've long loved the fact that I mastered 
color theory. I absolutely love it. Um, but composition just took me much longer. And that's why you can rely instead on things like the S design to help you through. And I use the S design all the time. I do try and vary it, though. I think as an artist, that's the other thing you can do. You're a creative person, so you'll find that you can just um, find little ways around it. Uh, that's I used to think colour was more important than composition, and now I've changed my mind. I think composition is number one. That's all I wanted to say about that one. Uh, in the composition phase, that's your opportunity to create original artwork. So you can change it from mine. You can change it from the image that we're working on. Um, artists have for centuries copied other artists. That's how artists learn. I think it's a beautiful thing to copy someone's art and then go and make it better if you want to or you just satisfy yourself by enjoying the process. Here's a piece of acetate. As I mentioned, you see how it's got a little bit of black stuff on the edge there and that's because, I'll just pull it off, I tore it off the front of one of those books. Of It was a course I went on and they made a little book out of it and they put a little plastic sheet on the front. That's acetate. That's what I used to make the um, stencil. Here's another idea. These are also from Officeworks. You know, you put papers in them. That's another thing that you could cut up to make a stencil. Right. Stencil. Oh, you'll need a, a cutting board. But as I say, we may not do that until next week. Colour. Let's start with colour so that we can get a big wash down and um, start with your colours and stick with them. I've got a little colour wheel here. I'm going to first talk about the colours that I'm going to use and why. So I have, these are my three colours. You'll find that I, one of the best things I learned about colour is limit the number of colours that you use. It was the best thing I ever did because I find that I rarely produce anything particularly garish because I limit the number of colours that I'm using. And also these tend to be single pigment. So um, very controversial thing I'm going to say now, but Payne's Grey, I do not use it. Um, okay, there's no do not. There's never a never. I rarely use it. I do still own a tube. But I find that if you mix your own greys, that uh, your paintings can look more vibrant. Having said that, there's no real rules. There's only um, um, suggestions. Thank you to everyone who has given me a thumbs up so far. That is so cool. Hey, jo morning, Joan. That's very cool you're here. Okay. I have... Um, the yellow I'm using is... Permanent yellow lemon. It's a single pigment and it's not a pure yellow. Pure yellow sits there and lemon yellow is the, has a hint of blue, green in it. The red, so I'm just, you could so easily say I'm using the three primaries, a yellow, a red and a blue. The red that I'm using, red would sit about here, a pure red, and I'm using... Quin, Acridone, Magenta. Quin, Acridone. I do actually know how to spell it. It's just that I don't bother to write it out in full. And the blue that I'm using, and this is pretty important. This is Thalo Blue. Thalo Blue is a pure blue. P-H-T-H, -H, though a lot of people skip the P-H these days. Thalo Blue. Thalo blue is particularly transparent. So if I grab my butterfly again and show you, I've painted uh, two layers of blue and I could have just gone darker in the first layer, but you do get more of a beautiful effect if you glaze one layer, let it dry, glaze another layer, let it dry, and then I began to lift it out. And underneath that blue is the orange background. I painted that orange background everywhere. Uh, you, but it's hard to tell, but I do find if I put a background everywhere that my subject can look a little more integrated. I'm pretty sure that's it, uh, that that is the reason why, having said that, um, you know, everyone's got an opinion on everything, which is why we're all so interesting and different. 
they're the three colors that I'm going for. Permanent yellow lemon, very transparent. Uh, cadmium yellow, however, is not on particularly transparent. So if you go for cadmium yellow, use it really sparingly, make it a really, really watery wash, and then it'll be more transparent. Phthalo blue is one of the most transparent blues there is. It is a little difficult to work with, though, because it doesn't behave as um, uh, kindly. I can't think of the right word. It doesn't behave as, uh, say, in such an easy manner as cobalt blue. However, cobalt blue um, moves and lifts more easily than phthalo. So if you wanted one that lifted more easily, uh, cobalt is good to go for. Thalo is a bit of a stainer. And uh, I'll show you that again. Some of that blue has stained the page and then, but you know, you can lift some of it and you still get that lovely effect. Quinacridone magenta. Oh, thank you for the extra thumbs up. That's awesome. Quinacridone magenta is a transparent. And if you're after um, the information about whether your color is transparent or not, you can look on the tube and uh, often brands will give you that information. I'm using two Holbein and one um, Daniel Smith. I tend to use mostly Holbein, um, but, you know, I've got a whole tube of phthalo blue. Uh, Deb says, do you need three hots or three colds? Yeah, so I know that so many people think in terms of, and, and when I first started to go to um workshops they always talked in terms of there's a warm and a cool yellow and a warm and a cool red and a warm and a cool, cool blue but I'm not so interested in that I'm interested in more in uh, whether it's transparent and um, I'm just thinking I'm not quite answering your question do you need three hots I assume you mean like three warms or three colds yeah so um okay so Technically, this permanent yellow lemon is on the colder side of yellow. So you could say this is a cool yellow. And definitely phthalo blue is a cool blue. And it's a pure blue as well. And then my only um, colour that isn't uh, cool is magenta. And actually, I'm glad you kind of said that because I'm just going to grab a different pen. If I divide the wheel, everything over here is, oh, <laughs> don't mind my spelling there. Everything on this side is warm and everything in this on this side is cool. So I have two cools and one that sits on the midline. So you can easily warm it up at the end. And I tend to do that in paintings. I get, I start with a limited palette and at the end, if I feel like it needs something else, I'll add it in at the end. But technically, um, this one, had I did use a warmer yellow. <laughs> I actually used Oriolan yellow, which I tend to use even more than permanent yellow lemon. But again, you know, I've got these and I love using stuff up. I'm quite sure that's the Scottish heritage in me. Uh, now... So yellow, blue, magenta, or three primaries. That was a good question, uh, Deb. And I'm going to give you a second in case anyone else wants to ask anything else. Do you want to know about substitutions? Do you want to know uh, anything else about colour theory? Together. So Deb says, do you need three? Do you need three hot or three cold together? I'm going to be using them together. I'm... I will be mixing these two to make an orange, which will be kind of warm, and then using uh, the phthalo on its own. I'm not sure if that's answered your question, Deb. Um, they are, I could say, one primary. The permanent yellow lemon is not really a primary. It's not really a secondary. Possibly, I guess you could call it a tertiary, and that's a secondary. So I've got one primary, one tertiary, one um, secondary. I think you would call that a tertiary. I'd have to think more on that. Jasmine says, I've got Quinn Rose. Will that be okay or pyro red? Excellent question. Right. So Quinn Rose, um, so this 
color theory that I love is by Stephen Quiller. And he names Quin Rose or Permanent Rose, it's, it goes under both names, as a pure red. So when I'm using pure red, I tend to use, really, I use a, a pink. So Pyrrole Red, I think, would be, it's, I don't know. Oh, good question. Is it a pure red? It's definitely a pure pigment. I think that um, I would squeeze out a little bit of both because you're going to be mixing an orange if you follow um, exactly what I'm doing. Of course, everyone changes stuff if they feel like it. You're going to be mixing an orange. So I would squeeze out a little bit of your pyrrole red, squeeze out a little bit of your quinacridone rose and um, mix it with the yellow you've chosen and see. Oh, thanks. Deb says thanks. So that's cool. I think I've answered your question then. And see what kind of orange it makes because you're after a lovely orange that is opposite the blue. So that's really what I'm doing. I'm using a complementary system. I'm mixing them together to make orange, but I like mixing my own orange because then I can use a little yellow on its own and a little magenta on its own and blue. So when two colors are opposite each other, you get, thanks Deb, you get a complementary color series here. So I've got blue and orange at the when you grind it down to the very basics, you've got blue and orange. And if you look back here, that's what will make my butterfly absolutely fly off the page is that the butterfly is blue and the vast majority of my background is orange. So the blue and the orange and the blue um, pop that little bit more. Hey, thanks, Trish. Thanks for saying that. That's so cool. Um, as I'll say every week, I could spend the whole time just talking colour theory. I find it infinitely fascinating and I love questions, especially when I don't know the answer because it'll make me go away and reread one of my uh, beautiful colour theory books. Okay, so that's that. Time to squeeze out some of this paint before I put it away. Uh, here's where my permanent yellow lemon lives on my palette. Oh, I'll zoom out so you can see that. Um, that one, I think. Does that zoom out? Does that zoom out? That one. All righty. I've squeezed out a big swatch. Hi, Philip. I've squeezed out a big swatch of um, permanent yellow lemon. And I love fresh paint. I do have, as you can see on my palette, um, I'm just going to spritz it, spritz the whole thing. That's, if anyone's working from pans, I recommend that. Uh, spritz the whole thing. Just wets it that little bit, makes you that little bit faster. Here's my quinacridone magenta. And I just love it. I use it all the time. But if you're painting like a fabulous poppy, you do need pyrrole red, such a wonderful red. That's my red. And then phthalo blue. So this is where my um, ultramarine lives. And I'm squeezing out I, phthalo blue. Don't mind that sound in the background. My husband has gone off to use his soda stream and he's <laughs> realised that he's making a noise while I'm doing this. Natasha says, somehow I'm three minutes behind the live. Ah, I can't see your question. Should I scroll back up? Natasha, to see your question? I can't see your question, Natasha, so maybe you need to ask it. That's weird about being, um, there's a lag. That's interesting. Um, and I must keep that in mind sometimes when I ask questions. And <laughs> sometimes no one answers and I'm like, oh, well, I'll just move on. Um, right, colours and warm and cold. Oh, that's the other thing that I've got a big balance going on of. Big batch of um, cool on bits of warm and then I've added bits of cool. And that's the part that I could um, play with uh, a lot more. I, this is like 95% finished. I want to just add something else. I just avoided using the word just because uh, we had a little bit of a joke. Um, about using the word just, that that could be a sign that your painting is finished. Okay, I can get rid of that. This is the paper I'm using now. My mock-up, so to speak, I'm, though I'm actually 
pretty bloody pleased with it, is on a half sheet, but that doesn't fit nicely into this desk here where I've got all my um, camera set up. So I'm going to use a quarter sheet, um, kind of similar to an A3 if you're thinking what size. And this brand I've discussed a little bit, haven't I? Bao Hong. I'm loving it, particularly because it gives you a um, quarter sheet. I quite like that um, format. So the dimensions, excuse that noise of me throwing that on the ground, the dimensions of this quarter sheet are going to be the same ratio-wise, the same as my half sheet, uh, and I just quite like that. The A3 I think is a little more European and this is a little more, now I'm talking talking something I don't can't really remember the uh, details of, so ignore that. Okay, back to my list here. I'm just moving my paper so I can't accidentally. All right, we've discussed colour. Hopefully you've got a good idea about the colour and just ask anything, comment anything um, if you're wondering stuff. Now, we're going to paint the background and that's going to dry and then we can go into the drawing while the background dries. Okay, get rid of that. Here's my page. I'm not going to bother to tape it down because I quite am going for these lovely soft edges. See, the paint went close and I didn't go for a, um, a border. I just like to mix it up all the time. All right. Um, oh, brushes. Last week I mentioned, I'll just do the brushes very quickly again because you guys know what you're talking about, what, what you're doing. Uh, a big brush for large applications of water. A spray bottle to get lovely, wispy, soft edges. How can I send my finish? Oh, do you mean, Deb, for some feedback or you'd like to give me your painting? Because <laughs> you could totally give me your painting. And um, I think you'd probably mean um, you'd like some feedback. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because I've got a Facebook group and um, it's within my, face, my Facebook page called Marion Chapman Sydney, Marion Chapman Artist Sydney. Within that there's a um, group called... Marion Chapman Studio, and you can ask to be invited to that, and I'll remember your name. And then you can post your picture there and get feedback. In fact, um, this week there was um, two awesome questions, one from um, – oh, damn – if you're listening, can you remember whoever posted the question about ultramarine and its granulation and, and the answer was ultramarine deep? Anyway, oh. anyway, uh, the other one was from Helen and she posted, she watched one of my videos about using wax paper and then she posted um, a, I was just reading Deb's uh, comment. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, she posted a picture of her painting. She watched my painting. She watched my YouTube painting where I use wax paper to create an abstract landscape. And then she followed that tutorial and then posted it for feedback. And that was really cool looking at her images in the stages and um, anyone is invited to give feedback. Um, and if you don't want feedback and you just want to share your art, then please make that clear because the last thing I want to do is say, hey, you could improve that. And you've actually thought to yourself, uh, hey, I really liked my artwork. I thought it was finished. I hate the idea that I would discourage anyone because everyone has an opinion. So Deb says, I buy A4 clear solid vinyl pieces from Snap Printing. Perfect. That's a great one. And your owl. Yeah, so great. If you'd like feedback on the owl, yeah, put it in the um in that Facebook group, just ask to be invited. And I know that you can ask that because someone did. And they were on here and um, uh, so I was able to accept them because I knew who they were. Uh, so Natasha says, no lag this time. I think I actually clicked something and it sent me back three minutes. Well, uh, but I can't catch up without missing some. Ah, I see. And Natasha also says, didn't have a cue, Kunakuran, but I really look for, didn't have a question. <laughs> but look forward to understanding how to do glazing more. Yeah. 
and it's um that's when we'll be doing glazing on the butterfly because that's got two layers and I also glazed this purple over the orange two opportunities for glazing in this painting oh brushes right a uh, big one for um, adding water quickly I use a mop a haka brush will do just as brilliantly I also have down here uh, two quills and size two and size zero. I love the quills because of the point. I've got um, one of these wispy brushes um, because that might work well for my splatter. It does a cute thing. Uh, my little tiny liner brush, which I'll use probably, I don't, I don't know. And I put these down towards the end of my uh, brush stand because I'll probably use them at the end uh, biggest to smallest because I start big and then get smaller and smaller as I move towards the detail big picture first small picture seconds kind of an awesome rule because when you're designing big shapes uh, for designing as well and uh, big shapes helps you see the bigger picture detail last um, yeah, so the flat one I tend to use at the end and it's a tiny one so I'll use that at the end and I've got a big brush now, we know that the design that we're using is an S shape. So uh, I'm going to spray in an S shape coming up to where I will place the butterfly. So I'm going to spray and then I'm going to splatter water. So splatter paint. So I need the paint ready first. I don't want that water to start to half dry. I want to be in control. So I'm going to prepare paint first. Wet my brush. I'm going to mix up a lovely batch of orange and I'm going to be using that a lot. Big dollop of this yellow. Turn it to cream. I tend to use a clean brush for yellow and then I get messy after that. And then I'm going to start with a really small amount of quinacridone or whatever red you're using. And you can see how yellow is so quickly dominated by another colour. And then I'm going to add a big squirt of water and make it runny. That will splatter more easily. If it's runny and it, you splatter it into a runny, wet section of your paper, it will spread more. Now, is it runny enough? I'm just going to show you just how runny it is. If I turn it on its side, is it running quickly? Not really. I'm going to make it less viscous, more water. All right, now it's running. I'll just show you that. If I turn it on its side, it quickly runs down. It's like very, very milky. Okay. I like to scrape, uh, scrape all the paint back in because with these brushes, the paint um, gathers at the base, at the belly of the brush, at the belly of the brush hairs. And that's why I do a lot of wiping it back in because I'm often end up painting on the belly. I'm painting with the tip. I think that's why I do it. Right. I'm going to spray in an S shape. And um, if you... Uh, like to be more in control, you could spend your time drawing these flowers in. You could so easily do the pen flowers first and then put the colour on. I like to be fast, so I constantly look for ways to speed up my process. Uh, so I'm going to spray in an S shape coming up and up to where the butterfly will go. Respray that. Up. I'm just moving in an S shape and adding some paint up the top there. So I've got this one loaded, but I think I'll try this wisp brush, see if I can get it to Yeah, that's good. I don't want any hardness. Oh, I'm going to move that. I'm going to turn that painting over actually. I don't want anything added to that that I wasn't intending. That's better. Also, I switched hands, so I'm a lefty, so my I have greater control with my left hand. All right, and I'm trying to be loose about my application. I'm splattering my book. Love that book. 
load up, get some more. Add as much or as little as you want. I am after a reasonably pale background and I will get that. I've added water and I've added water to the page and it was a wet mix. So both of those things will make this orange light. And of course the other thing that will make it light is watercolour dries lighter. 10 to 15 percent lighter depending on who you listen to. All right, is that enough? Yep, I think so. I'm going, I don't want those dots, so I'm going to spray them, make them dissipate. Spray anything dotty. I don't really want to see hard dots. I want anything hard. I want the background to just mist off into nothingness. So I've kind of lost a bit of the um, S shape, but I don't mind that at all. I'm now going to grab tissues and firstly I'm going to just tip it this way while I clean the background, tipping it very particularly so it moves this direction, just cleaning up there so that I don't have water where I don't want it and I'm going to try and make it run in this direction that if I'm lucky will assist the look of the S and um, this idea that I'm drawing you in around this way. So if you don't want orange behind your butterfly, which will be generally in this area, uh, now is your opportunity to go dab dab. So for example, this orange is quite dark. So you could easily think, mm, I don't really want that much orange behind my butterfly. So I, I might take a little bit off and it's quite dark there and my butterfly might end up there. Take a little bit off. Okay, now. This would be a great opportunity to go and get yourself a cup of coffee. Not today, not right now, but if you're working on this project again, this would be a great opportunity to get a cup of coffee uh, and because then you could let that dry because this has to dry before we go to the next section. What I'm going to do is, is dab off where there's excess moisture but very particularly not on my S curve and I might dab off that. That will assist drying, avoid back runs and uh, get it um, drying. Now, I, because I'm now going to start to draw and design the next phase, I'm not going to just leave this alone to dry. I'm going to instead dry it. I'm going to half dry it and then it can air dry while we start drawing. So I'm going to mute myself, grabbing my hair dryer. I'm going to start drying and probably only dry for about a minute. So I'll mute myself. Okay, it's about half dry, but I don't, 
I expect that while I set it aside and start the drawing section, that it will um, dry completely. Uh, and I love Karen's comment there. I just finished my coffee and biscuits. <laughs> That's so cool. And you've got a sweetheart who brings it into you in the middle class. That's so beautiful. What a supportive thing to, to do to allow you to um, keep going and not have to go and make your own <laughs> coffee or tea. Uh, now I'm working out where to put this. I've got this tiny table and I am just surrounded by stuff. I'm not going to show you because it looks a bit ridiculous. I'm looking for a flat spot. Excuse the noise. There. I was looking for a flat spot so that I could let it dry. Okay. We've put in this whole background. Uh, we need to start to draw the butterfly because that's our focal point. It's very clear, very clear this is the focal point. Um, we don't have to work hard on that at all. We don't have to think of ways to make a focal point more interesting because, bam, there's the uh, butterfly. And it is such a clear focal point because of the colour. So there's a dramatic colour contrast. It's a focal point because of the size, dramatic size change. from, And then there's a dramatic focal point again because it's not um, outlined in thin marker. I went for a thick marker, though, as I say, I haven't quite finished that butterfly. I want a little more black on it. Uh, yeah, so there are some of the elements of art that this is, that I'm using to bring us, to bring your eye to focus. Okay. We've done the colour. We've done. We, now we've painted our background. Uh, we're up to draw and then transfer the design, the butterfly. I'm not going to worry about these um, uh, flowers. I did them as a continuous line drawing. So the outline of those flowers probably took me a, five minutes in comparison to the whole project taking about two hours. The drawing of those flowers was incredibly fast um, and it's a continuous line drawing. It's a method that I use all the time because it's fast and I love fast stuff. Oh, I've just re realised I forgot to show you. I got a collection of um, the butterflies that I have um, show off five minutes. <laughs> I love that you said that. Oh, thanks, Karen. Too funny. Um, uh, this is the butterfly that was on the as um, the thumbnail for this live stream because I have to go and pick something because you um, because I schedule in it in advance. So it's not that we're painting that one, but it did remind me about this. Um, Stencil uh, method that I used. I also did masking fluid around the outside. Oh, I need to zoom in to talk about some methods there. Here, I should say. Uh, so I've done many butterflies using masking fluid and um, they really don't work. I, <laughs> I did that for, I don't know, 10 times. So I think as I go through these, I'm not going to use much masking fluid. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a liar already. Uh, this is a big bee for butterfly. Uh, oh, there's a bigger version. That's much better. Okay. I love calligraphy. So this is me playing with a big bee. Oh, no, that's a different one. Wow, I've forgotten that. I did um, – oh, it's really hard to see, isn't it? Anyway, I did the word butterfly in um, masking fluid and then painted over it uh, with big bee. I um, – I do love masking fluid, but I try not to do my butterflies now with masking fluid, I've got to say. Uh, that's another B for butterfly that I did, and I used a little bit of Latin. One of my other many skills, <laughs> painting, gardening, uh, Latin. I have a thing for it. Uh, this is a picture from my exhibition. It reminded me to talk about um, incredibly loose ones. I might have another picture of that. But there, it, this is a pile of um, paintings that was ready for a big butterfly exhibition that I had and this one was a cutout. This is another way to do butterflies with watercolour. So if I just put that in the centre, 
It's the back of a watercolour painting and I used a black, I drew the butterflies on, one flowing this one, one flowing that way, and then I cut out using the blade and turned all the backs of the pieces over um, and then mounted it on another watercolour. Really um, quite easy to do, a bit time consuming, can kind of hurt your hand a bit, but there is, I'm just talking generally about butterflies. That's what that um, painting actually was designed as. This was the thumbnail for last week's butterfly painting and I used the bottom half. I tore two pages, a, a single large sheet of watercolour in half and then painted at the same time and um, I didn't use tape and then I was able to have two paintings that I sold as a diptych. No, I didn't sell this one. I cut it up. Yeah, I tried to sell it. <laughs> uh, this is another painting that I used wax paper as a background. I love this method. You put down a really fast and loose background and then spend time um, lifting out a butterfly from the background. This is a butterfly. Uh, I'm sorry it's not a better picture, but I won um, um, an award for this one. I can't remember whether it was the abstract section or the water. I don't think it was the watercolour section. Um, but anyway, uh, that's the flyer from the butterfly effect. That's the exhibition I had at Hunter's Hill. Wow, 2015. That was a while ago. This is another thing that I did with butterflies is um, I painted a large abstract and it was intended to be cut up. So I then drew the butterfly on it and then cut it out with a blade and softened all the edges with a little bit of colour. And at that stage, my son was still living at home. Thank you, Karen. Um, <laughs> and Deb, Deb's got a little bit of Latin there for me. Thank you. I love you too. <laughs> um at that stage, my son was living at home, and so he did the cutting for me because it killed my hand. This is 300 GSM, this paper. Um, you can see that at Hunters Hill I hung it outside the exhibition to try and draw people in. I've tried a 1,000 things with butterflies and exhibiting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, these are some of the – oh, that's actually in my studio at home. I went through a phase of having the um, – the, one of the rooms in my downstairs converted to a, a, um, an exhibition space. And this was some of the paintings that didn't sell at Hunter's Hill. But then this awesome lady came and visited my home and bought this one and another huge one, the most huge one um, that I've ever sold. I know this one is hard to see. This is an exhibition that um, was well, not so much an exhibition but a share space at Cornell. So anyone who's... Um, been in one of those co-ops would know what that's like. It's a really cool way to get your art out there. And the, a lady came in and uh, bought this one, but she lived in Perth, so she didn't want the frame. And I took it out of the frame and posted it to her. And then since she loved the frame, but um, didn't want to have to pay for the postage. Uh, and it only cost me $40 to send it to Perth in a big flat pack. And then I sent her lots of pictures showing uh, what the frame looked like on different angles so she could get a framer over there to do it. This one I is super abstract. And I one of the edges I added little tiny uh, beads. You know, you can buy those little tiny micro beads. And then I just added glue um, at the end and added little micro beads. I just loved this one. You know how you fall in love with some of your own paintings and then no one buys them and you're like, that's okay. I liked that one. Sometimes I sell paintings and I'm really sorry because <laughs> I really liked it. Um, but always getting rid of a painting is an opportunity to make another painting. And, and the older I get, the I'm going to dump them. The older I get, and I'm bringing back my bank paper to show you, the older I get, the more I am way more enamoured with the process. Okay, piece of bank paper or any white paper to start to draw your butterfly. I'm going to tear it off. I now have a sheet of bank paper, any white paper, so that we can draw the butterfly, and I'm going to show you in a moment. I might put something this cutting board I wonder if this will help the camera see where the edges of this yeah oh instantly the camera light goes 
Okay, I like that. Now, you may recall last week I went through this method of how to draw a butterfly, and this is the one I'm going to refer to today. I'll just zoom in and go through it very quickly because this, if you want, just grab your picture of whatever your butterfly is that you're adding today because it may not be a swallowtail. It might be any sort of butterfly or you might be going more generic. I'm going to be using this method here. It's just those two lines and it's that simple. You do a big cross um, body, thorax, abdomen. I've got that in the wrong order, haven't I? No, I have. That's the correct one because thorax means chest. Head, thorax, abdomen, and you do a cross piece and that helps you do the outline. That's how I'm going to draw my butterfly today. And this one, of course, has all the detail in it and mine doesn't. I'm going to extend the little bottom pieces to turn it into a more recognisable swallowtail. Okay, I'm going to keep this book. I'm going to draw, actually, I'm going to turn that on the side because I'm going to start with the size that I want my butterfly to be. I'm going to get a pencil. Now, I'll do it with a um, pen because that'll be much easier for you to see. This is the size of my paper. So I'm just going to place that there for a moment and go, okay, how big do I want my butterfly? I'm not going to pick up my wet art. It's half wet. So I'm going to be turning it on the side because I like obliques. I think they bring action to your um, a sense of energy. Um, if you want your butterfly to be perfectly straight, as it is in the image, it's perfectly horizontal, then do that. Okay, camera, work it out. I'll just um, see if I can get the camera to refocus. There. I'm just going to take a moment to decide on the size, decide on the angle of your butterfly. Yeah, so I was talking about um, obliques, which is just angles, and how they can introduce energy into a composition. If you want the idea that it's more serene, that your butterfly has landed, and you want the idea that it's really soft and gentle and life is smooth and sweet, then you could place your butterfly on a very horizontal um, angle. Is that a proper sentence? Don't know. Anyway, I'm going to start by saying I want it on an angle. I love uh, to change the image. I don't want to copy the image too much. I like to make changes, to make it my own. And I'm going to use this green one to go, this is how wide I want it. I want it about from there to there. And then it will be about that wide. I'm just th imagining that and placement. Uh, and I'll easily be able to switch it that way. When I bring back my painting, I'll make that decision. Um, so I'm going to go this way for now. And that will be the width. Okay, I can get rid of this paper. Excuse the bang as that lands. I'm now going to bring this down and see if I can bring the book down. Unfortunately, it's hard to keep both of those in. So apologies for that. You can copy along, follow along with me. So this is how wide the butterfly is. I'm going to draw it straight and then turn it when I go to trace it um, onto my actual paper. So that means that the X will go from about here to about here. Oh, no, I'm doing it straight. Remember that. About here to about here. And, um, you know, this grid, I can just see it through it. It's actually super helpful. Love happy accidents like that. Okay, I'm going to get the image so that I can be referencing that. I'm dumping as I'm talking and so... You'll have to give me a second while I find my, um, this is the image we're working from. There. Oh, that fits in the screen. I'll move that over a little bit so it fits nicely. There. Okay. Now the X will go from there to there. So I want to draw in those points. And, in fact, 
this butterfly's wings tilt down. So I'm going to go a little lower. That's the extent and that's the extent about there. And it will go around. I'm just, this is the way I always start when I'm drawing uh, markers to go. This is how big it will be. This saves so much time rubbing out if you put in um, some dots first to say this is where I'm heading. That's where the top of the, right, that's the outside. So the middle is about, if I use these little grids, this will actually really help me because that's like, I'm going to move this over. Gosh, I'm so going to use this. This is from Kmart, this um, cutting board. Okay, I'm fine there. I'm just taking a second to see. <laughs> where the center is. Okay, there's the center. If that's the tips of the wings, if they're out there, that when you join it is where the wings come down to. So if that comes in there, there'll be a head and the wings will come down to there Not like that. Okay, so then I've got the center. So the big Y will go from down and down and the bottom of the butterfly, I'm going to place not in the middle of the wing, but closer to the body. I'm, I'm making that decision based on the actual distance. So if I run my finger up from the base of the swallowtail, the tail, up, it's quite close to the head, not close to the tip of the wing. So I'm going to do the same thing, come down about here. Do I want it this long? That's about how much space I've got. I could go a little longer about there and about there. And I'm going to put that in the little tail. This is helping me just place where all the things will go. Now the wing, the center, um, line will come up to about there. Okay. And it goes down to when I'm just muttering away here. Hopefully this is making some sort of sense. Okay. Here's the big X comes down like that. And that mark is that mark and down like that big X. And here's the big Y, come in, and this, I'm going to make that the central point. So I'm going to go from there to there. It takes a little bit of time to, butterflies are incredibly attractive. And part of that attractiveness is that they look the same on both sides. Okay, there's my X, there's my cross piece. I've got the head uh, right up there, which will help me go. Okay, the wing comes around and down and around. It goes to about there. Lots of dots to help you plot your course less rubbing out if you do it. Oh, that's about right. This one comes down to there. So you might just be paying no attention to me and drawing your own butterfly there. I'm just saying that a lot, aren't I? There, there. That goes out to there. Lots of dots to guide your Drawing, go slow if you want to, and then the body, there's this beautiful space in amongst there. So being even as you do it is quite important when drawing a butterfly. You 
could take five times as long to draw this. Okay, now I'm going to cross out that, cross out that as a reminder to myself, they're guidelines. That's a guideline. Don't trace that. I will include this line, but I will change it a little bit because, in fact, on the swallowtail it does head upwards, go up there. So I'm going to get another pen to remind myself about where it's going. I'm going to make that head smaller. I'm just going to redraw the line so I know what to follow. And it goes up there, there. Hopefully this will allow me to make less mistakes. This edge actually in reality has lots of loopy bits on it, but I've skipped all of that. And this line and this line. I'm just going to redraw them because I'll forget. I know I will redraw. Right, I'm coming down and outlining. There's the tails. And I'm just guaranteeing that I won't forget which lines to use when I add the pastel to the back. And that's the body. I've made the, the head way too round. They're kind of more square than they are round and then they've got kind of like, I assume, eyes. They've certainly, they've usually got um, proboscis, 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 I don't know. Depends. <laughs> Funny that I would have mentioned um, Latin earlier. Depends whether or not it's a Latin word or a Latin, Latinate word. Um, I'm just double checking. Is it good enough? And this is the point at which you completely and utterly make your own decisions about this. Some people absolutely love to get into the detail. You might want to spend a really long time drawing it up, but I want to get cracking onto the next phase. So um, my butterfly, it's good enough to get going. Also, it's about pleasure. I'm just getting some pastel. We're doing the same method as last week, and I'm adding pastel to the back. It's totally about pleasure. If your pleasure is in drawing up, I'm just going to add pastel while I'm talking. If your pleasure is in drawing and being accurate, then do that. I find that when I try to be accurate, I can start, it brings out the perfectionist in me, and then I get disappointed, and then I stop, and then I give up, and then I think it's no good. So I've developed lots of ways to um, keep going and finish because I love finishing pieces of art. That's such a pleasure. Just adding pastel everywhere. There's that thick line. Get rid of that. Here's my bin. I'm just going to get rid of the excess. As I mentioned last week, it doesn't matter that some of that pastel, the excess pastel, ends up on your page. I used a beautiful quality pastel, which means that it's mostly pigment with a little bit of binder. Right. I am ready to transfer my butterfly. It's still um, a little bit damp. So I have no trouble. It, I know that the pastel won't overly, like it's not like it glues to the surface, even though my background is a tiny bit damp. Oh, thanks, Philip. He says, wise advice for dealing with perfection. Thank you. We'll try. Oh, yes. It, Perfectionism is is um, not great in art. I'm sure there's many ways in life in which being a perfectionist is awesome. And um, I worked in admin a lot and being a perfectionist in admin 
makes you a brilliant admin person because it's attention to detail and getting everything completely right. But in art, it holds you back. Uh, now, do I want my butterfly to go like that? I could make it even, oh, I need to bring that down a little bit for you. There. I could, if the butterfly is too large, I could bring um, just trace within those lines and make it a touch smaller, which I think I actually might. So will I place it that way? I'm going to show you my painting. I And I'll zoom out for that. So I came up this way and around and placed it there. So I need to have that in mind. Do I want it on the same angle? I'm going to come up and place it there because I could place it there. Come up and place it that way. Mm. Or I could go for the um, super solid horizontal version to make it a little possibly a little calmer in design. I think I will test out my theory, partly because I've drawn it a little bit big and it's kind of going to go close to the edges or I could place it off the edge a little bit. Ooh, that's an interesting thought. Should I come up and place it there? I'm really going to spend another whole minute before committing. Come up and place it there and have some of the butterfly off the page. Will that? Right, I think that's a worthy experiment. Will I go that way or that way? See, part of the problem is that I have a thing for this <laughs> direction. It just satisfies me. So should I have a little bit of the back butterfly go off? Yeah, all right. I think place the butterfly wherever you like. Now, if you want to be super careful, you could put a bit of tape here and here. I'm not too worried. I'm going to get a um, pencil because if I pierce this page, I don't want to have anything go through. So I'm not going to trace with a pen in case I pierce the page. Tracing now. And check. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Come up. Be mindful not to do a little circle for their head. I'm going to not worry about the antennae. That can be placed at the end. I'm going off the page. I'm just holding the whole thing in place. Double check again. Yes. Oh, see, it's transferring beautifully. Now, how far did I get? I got up to there. Keeping both hands on it so that it can't shift. Or you use piss tape. Might make that go down a little and match it. It's kind of cool with the, this tracing method is that you can adjust slightly. Now, have I done the body? Nope. I'm going to put the body in. Such an amazing butterfly. Okay, just check that side, check that side and take it off. And... Right, um, <laughs> I like that. I <laughs> tempted to say, "Cool, we're all done," because it's um pretty. The blue pastel on the uh, orange, just that basic use of complementary colors. Now, is it dry enough for me to put the flowers on? Because you have to put the butterfly on before you do the flowers. Uh, Philip says, as I don't have pastels because I use watercolour pencils to do the tracing with. I haven't tried that, Philip. Excellent question. And um, I would love to know whether or not it would. So the binder in watercolour pencils tends to be a little bit um, waxy. 
And so I've got no idea how well that will transfer. If you don't have pastels, you could certainly use a lead pencil and you would use the side. I'll just demonstrate what I mean. Use the side and just go over the back of your paper using a bit of graphite because that will certainly transfer. And if you do use watercolour pencils, I'd love to know whether or not that works because that's really interesting. I've got spare watercolour pencils too. I love using up stuff. Okay, I've got um, my flowers to go in next and it is so dry enough. If you're not familiar with your pen and how it behaves with water, I'm just searching for my other one, you might want to do a little test. You might want to grab a piece of um, paper and do this. Pen, pen, and then go. Does it move? So this one moves ever so slightly and that one didn't move at all. It's just a bit of knowledge so that later on you don't get a surprise where you don't want a surprise. Okay. I like this pen. I like how thin it is. I like how delightful it is. Now, I did not draw this on. Ah, oh, thanks, Philip. And all I did was do a line drawing. So... I'm going to do it straight on, just moving it about so that it's within picture and you can see what I'm doing there. And I wonder if I can zoom in a little bit while, yeah, I can. Excellent. There. I'll just push it up for a second. Oh, Amanda says, I just, oopsie. That's my mouse falling onto the ground. Amanda says, I just used baking paper instead of tracing paper for my butterfly. Thank you, Amanda. Excellent advice there. Very available. Who doesn't love baking paper? Most awesome product. And biodegradable. Love that. I'm going to free draw using the continuous line drawing. So very quick moment um, to talk about continuous line drawing. I'm grabbing a piece of paper. So continuous line drawing means that you stare at your subject way more than you stare at your piece of paper. Deb says, I got Reeve pastel sticks from Officeworks, $3. <laughs> Officeworks are so going into art supplies in a big way. And I wonder whether that's a lockdown thing that way more people are doing art in uh, lockdown because talk about an excellent thing to do in um, lockdown. And it's so good for your, um, I was going to say your body. It's not that good for your body. I've been sitting down for an hour and a half. Uh, no, it's really good for your brain. And Reet, I'm talking about continuous line drawing. Technically, uh, you start at a point. So I'm going to stare at this flower and start. It doesn't matter where you start, I don't think. But I'm going to start at the centre and you draw. So I'm glancing at this so that I know where I am in space, as in on the page. Um, but my focus is on this flower and I free draw. And as you can see, I'm not taking my pen off the page, what I'm doing is just continuing to draw and I'm just going over the lines and then I'm done. And that's how I did all of these um, flowers. I began with this one here and then went back and then continued on and um, in that way, I got all those flowers done in a really short period of time. And continuous line drawing, if you are find you're a perfectionist, continuous line drawing is the best thing I've ever, ever discovered. I got that out of a book, continuous line drawing, uh, a drawing book, one of those wonderful ones where they use continuous line drawing as a warm-up. And um, I use it in many ways. So 
I'm just going to clean the tip of that. This flower I'm generally going to place here and I'm going to begin with this flower because it's more important than the background elements. I'm going to begin there and um, I'm going to do a flower stop and a flower and stop and a flower and stop. So I'm not technically following the rules of continuous line and uh, drawing, which is you don't stop to your finished. You could if you totally enjoy that. There is this beautiful patch of orange. This is the value in doing your background first. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that there's this beautiful patch of orange and put that flower here. The other thing that I'm going to do is turn it on its side, thinking of ways to just kind of change it. It's got this pointy bit, so I'm kind of thinking if I turn it that way, nope, if I turn it that way that will be pointing towards the edge and I wonder if that might be an extra way of um, using line to bring me to bring the viewer's eye into my painting I have all these ideas and you know some of them work so I'm going to start here now I could make it a little smaller or I could make it larger smaller larger hmm I definitely much smaller than the butterfly. If I make it about that size, the butterfly is still much larger. Yeah, okay. Decision made. I'm going to start line drawing and draw a series of flowers that follow the S and come up to here and I'm going to poke it out there and poke it out there, maybe poke it out over there. There's a beautiful patch of orange there that I want to make use of. Um, this one... And I'm going to start in the center. I don't have a good reason for that. I just find it's a little easier, I think. So starting line drawing. So you'll forgive me if I don't talk while I focus on the image and focus one second here, five seconds here, one second, five second, 90% of your time on the image. Here goes. You can see that I'm unable to talk while I'm doing that. I'm focusing really hard on paying as much attention as I possibly can to the flower to try and get a, um, an idea of this shape down. But as you can see, I got it down in like, I don't know, a minute. I'm guessing. I don't know. And um, I'm now going to turn it back around to decide which flower next. So I'm not necessarily going to do them in that order, but I do like the idea that there's a connecting line. This one actually has a stalk down here, but I've um, kept it to its natural stalk being up here. So I'm just going to invent um, some sort of shape that comes down this way. So there's this beautiful one here. I'm going to use this shape next and draw this. like that, just so that there's a connecting shape. They just look kind of organic looking. And I quite like that that's connected there. I have this compulsion to add something over there, but I'm going to resist that compulsion for a moment um, because sometimes those things don't help. Now, which flower next? This one, I think. I love this one here. So I'm going to turn it again. And all these little changes, I think, help to make the painting yours. Now, again, I'm just going to put that there. And I won't go up there. 
I'll just come down here a little bit. I want, do want each um, flower shape to somehow touch the next flower shape. So if it's not a stalk, then actually have the flowers um, connected. So I'll just show you this one again. Uh, this one touches that one. This one touches the stalk. That touches the stalk. And then there's a little gap, but there's a stalk that connects. And that touches, that touches, that touches, that every single one touches. And then I put a flower up the top. I think that helps with your design. And um, this one I decided on and this angle and I'm going to make it touch here. So I made that stalk go too far. So maybe I can't manage that. I'll see. Okay, I'm going quiet for a moment while I do a continuous line drawing. That's number two. Oh, I missed a bit over there and there. There. And, yep. Oh, I've realised what I could do over there. Oh, and Deb says $7 each pastels have single pastels made in France. Wow. I'm going to put this bud coming into the page I th and I think I might even leave a little gap. So will the bud, which way will the bud go? This way, this way? Yeah, I'm just going to have this bud entering the space. And it's got a stalk that will connect it. Yeah, I like that. And so I've anchored it there and there. Up here. Now then, we'll go for this one. So I think what we'll do is finish the flowers and uh, then get down a layer of the butterfly. And that way, next week, we can start um, making these flowers pop. I'll just show you that. I drew the flowers over the background, as, as we're doing right now, and then I negatively painted them. And that's what's making them lighter than the background, which makes them pop. So I'm just using tone to do that. The same color. No, it's not. It's purple over orange. Different color. And um, so we'll do this next layer next week and then we'll be able to get a second layer on the butterfly as well. And we can talk about stencils next week. So I want to finish drawing the flowers and get a layer down on the butterfly so that it can dry beautifully for next week. Now, up to the next flower. I might include this cute little bud down here. Next flower, I think I will try and go smaller to try and make this shape as though it comes up and gets smaller. Ooh, possibly a little triangular. Not sure about that, but anyway, I definitely want to try and go smaller, even though in the photo it's not. I'm just using that compositional um, element to reduce the shape in size. Um, which flower is the next question? I'm loving the buds, actually. Uh, I think I'll use this, no, this flower again, but I'll change the angle so can't even tell which angle I did it on. Maybe I'll use a different flower. I know, I'll use this lovely abstract shape again and just go smaller and make it touch. 
Maybe I'll go this way, each time changing it. Just touching first. smaller and then um, one that's will I actually touch over there or will I go up there now will I I'm trying to say this out loud so that um, try and uh, um, bring you into my thought process um, but basically I'm following the S very basically and uh, right, where will the next flower go? Will it go off there and then come back in? Or do I just turn the corner here? Now I feel like it does need anchoring over there. So this flower here, but I'm, I don't want it too large. And I'm going to add a stalk. That's how I'll anchor it off the page. And uh, a broken line, easy to join it up later if it's, if I want to. But um, broken lines can look so interesting. And then I'm going to turn the corner and it's going to go under that tail there. That's good. Okay, so I've got this stem that's coming up here. I'm going to resist putting it over there because it's, it's not realistic. It's, it's a design. I'm in the design thinking phase. So uh, I'm going to make it come out there and turn a corner. Dot dot. I'm going to try to be thinking about. Oh, I'm going to put a little bud in there. And up here. I don't know if everyone else has finished theirs. I'm taking so much longer. I'm trying to talk through the process at the same time as um, draw it. Uh, I want it to come under there and it go there. So there's this beautiful one here. Okay, let's do that one. And I'll start from the center, come out and touch that. And I want it to be behind the tail. took my pen off and I'm just fixing it up. Okay, this one. Karen made a joke earlier about um, <laughs> me saying that I took five minutes. I wonder if it's possible that I completely underestimate. I'm just going to add a line there. It doesn't make sense. I don't know whether I completely underestimated that and it felt like five minutes, but in fact maybe I took way longer and um, I wasn't conscious of how long it took because I was totally in the zone. I'm going to add a little bud over here. That bud goes that way, that way, that way. I love the idea that you change the direction all the time. I want something that comes out here, but I don't want to replicate that. So if I turn this around and go that way, not that way, but it could, oh, lovely, hang down that way. And I'm going to 
bring it down and touch. And nearly done. A couple more. Oh, Karen says, I was wondering. Oh, you were wondering. If the How long I took. <laughs> There's this beautiful hooky thing here um, that's hanging out the center of the, I assume it's the part of the center part of these orchids and it's hanging down. It's quite lovely. Um, and I keep wanting to use it but I'm going to resist right now. All right, so I'm coming up here. I've hit here. I need to add a little more there and maybe come out there. Add another one. Oh, I'll go back to this lovely one down here now and use it this way up and start in the centre. Where will I make the centre? I'll make the centre behind this part here. Okay. Okay. Quiet again while I draw that in. Tiny bit pop out over here. I'm actually referencing that one there. Oh, there's another beautiful bud there I've just noticed. And then I want it to pop out up here, as it does in the photograph. And which one will I choose? Uh, so is it soaring off the page? And so do as in, do I make this um, an orchid that is landed on? Or because I've got this action, is it has it finished feeding on the orchid and now it's taking off? So if I put in a small orchid, perhaps it's taken off. If I put in a larger orchid, perhaps it's landed. So I'm going to go for the larger um, orchid and then it might look like it's landed. Not necessarily logical, I know, with my um, large, smaller, but I was using size to try and um, make it look uh, more interesting. The reality is in art that I constantly make mistakes and sometimes pull it off and sometimes I don't. Oh, I'm going to use that one there. Okay. Make it the center would be possibly where the, mm, I'm sure, don't want to spend too, too much time on that. Okay. I'm going to make the center of the flower here behind the head and draw in a large Petal, there's a smaller petal, beautiful triangular bit, and the other petal goes over there. I can add more detail to that at the end, absolutely. All righty. Now, do you want to hang around and get the first layer of the um, cobalt? No, phthalo blue down, or are you all like, oh, I need a stretch. I've had enough. I'm going to give you a minute while I stretch my arms out because, oh, I've been focusing for a while there. Do you want to hang about and get the phthalo down, or are you all like, no, nah, I'm, I'm heading off. Um, I've had enough. Thank you for the thumbs up. That's absolutely beautiful. Right, that's all I needed was one yes, fantastic. Let's get down a layer of phthalo. Uh, I didn't use the um, big brush. I'm going to zoom out a little bit so you can see um, my palette a little more. 
I think that one take nope that takes me in that takes me out and Jasmine says she needs time to do drawing yeah totally understand um and you get to spend as long or as as you want on the drawing phase now the beauty of this blue is it um most of it is going to be uh kind of dissolved as I paint the um a layer of halo down I'm going to use a watery layer watery paint in watercolor generally way more easy than thicker paint thicker paint uh, the thicker you get uh, the harder it is it, it's a little longer to get the uh, paint down and therefore it introduces more um, opportunities for back runs and it just gets a little harder so a watery wash is going to make this job really really easy I'm going to put a whole layer of phthalo over the whole uh, body if I remember I'll leave a little sliver so that there's a highlight on the body it's very easy to cover later on if I don't um, like the oh, I need water <laughs> it's very easy to do later on I'm just going to say that again. If you leave the highlight now, it's very easy to cover if later on you don't like the highlight for any reason. Uh, you could put a bit of masking fluid on there if you want to guarantee that your highlight will appear. I'm just going to try really hard to remember. But who knows? I get focusing and then I um, don't remember. I'm going to take, oh, that's my brush with all the orange on it. I'm going to take, just getting rid of the orange because that totally neutralizes blue and I want a crystal clear blue. I've got one well here, so that's cool. Lots of water. Prepare your paint first. I'll take a dab of the beautiful phthalo blue super transparent and we're doing transparent layers today I'm just going to grab a piece of paper and show you the tone really light and then it will go even lighter again and <laughs> Deb's giving me a cute little um a cute little smiley face and it's got a cute little hand in it my computer is actually um in front of me there so when I'm looking the, I can see the text, but I'm, I'm, it's a cute face. <laughs> uh, so that's how pale my tone is. On top of that, I'm going to be adding water first. So I'm going to be adding a layer of water, which will lighten that tone again. It's going to end up this first layer really light, and um, I'm happy with that. It will stain the paper and it will be layer number one and then we'll come in and glaze layer number two next week. Right. <laughs> I'm going to move this out of the way. Excuse the bang. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit so it'll be a little easier to see the, uh, the painting process. And if I move it on the side, you can see the palette a little more easily. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, so this brush has a super wet. What should I do with this one? This is just water. I might use my um, mop brush to get. No, that'll be too wet. Oh, I've made that mistake a thousand times. I'm going to put the water down with the number zero black quill and then I will control the amount of water that goes there. I think when I uh, get impatient I use the mop brush for internal um, sections and then I'm just disappointed. It's actually completely dry. I didn't use it today. Um, right, water. I'm going to wet that whole section and I'm going to do it lightly. I don't want to disturb the layer that's there. I just want to add water so that I can add a layer of phthalo. I'm using the tip to touch the edge, tip to touch the edge, tip to touch the edge. And you can see your pastel melt away, tip to touch the edge. And then I'm going to 
quickly glaze in. I kind of went around the outside, which <laughs> I don't like to do, but anyway, and bring it down and keep your eye on any back runs. More water again. Glaze with, like, if this isn't an opportunity for saying butterfly touch, this is, is the perfect opportunity to say butterfly touch. I'm putting the water on and I am barely touching the surface as I do it. I don't want to disturb that layer. I want to get a layer on top. I want to get the paint on it as quickly as I can and as gently as I can, which is why you so want a watercolour brush for this because it's gentle. If you find that the bottom layer is mixing with this layer, it's purely because your either your pressure is too hard or you don't have a watercolour brush or your watercolour brush isn't soft enough. That's when all these beautiful soft hairs really become important. Done a little bit of that um, orange is glowing through, so that means I pretty much managed to not disturb that layer and add a layer on top. Your goal is to add layer over other layers. Isn't it pretty while it's wet? Oh, I wish it just looked like that sometimes. I so see why people love um, acrylics and all those beautiful glossy things because of this moment when it's glossy because of the water. Okay, next wing, water first, and again, Apply the paint as gently as you can while getting the water down. Gentle, gentle touch. Gentle butterfly touch. It's kind of cool to say that today. Okay, that edge, bring it down, bring it down. Don't go over anything. If you miss a bit, don't worry. You're going to put another layer on next bit next week. Just keep gently your pressure, even pressure, gentle off to the edge, one more wing, come down, same process, water with a gentle touch, don't go over a spot, try to apply the water and move to the next section. Back to my blue and I'm going to tickle along that line. I've kind of left a little gap, that was a good idea, I didn't do that on the other side. Come down ever so gently ever so gently. I'm using the tip for detail, whisk it round, easier for my left hand. That's why I didn't tape it down. That's just paid off. Now that's one of the reasons why. Tip for the detail, belly to get big strokes of colour done. Try not to fix up your mistakes. Think I'll get that layer next week because it's really wet and all you might do is disturb the layer beneath. Now I'm going to sit with it for a minute. It's so pretty already. And check that there's no big blobby bits of water because that's how you'll get a back run. And I'm ready for the body. Okay. Now I mentioned that I'm going to try and negatively paint a little highlight. So I'm going to paint around a highlight and around a highlight. There's the base of the body. Or maybe I'll put a little highlight in there as well. Easy to cover later on. So easy. I'm going to turn it around, make it easier for me. Come up. And do the um, head, which it's not a circle. I'm telling myself. Not a circle, don't paint a circle. I'm trying to put little lumps on it so it's more like the insect's actual head. Now, I've just introduced water into the center there. It's doing a beautiful thing where it's um, traveling out and just seeping out so beautifully. And I'm going to take a little risk. I'm going to get some dark, dark earth, um, phthalo on my brush. That's the beauty of that fresh paint. Took me two secs. And I'm going to see if I can brush it in on the body, make the body a little darker right now. Dash, dash, <laughs> dash, dash on the head. 
dash on the body and it'll do this seepage thing. Go that side of the highlight and that side of the highlight. As I say, those highlights easy to get rid of later, but sometimes leaving little bits of that background can be so beautiful. Okay, I've got it flat and if I'm lucky, it will just evenly go this side and that side. Whereas if I tip, it'll go faster that way and faster that way. If I hold that up, you can see that it's doing the most divine spidery thing and I need to keep that flat, which means if there's any sort of puddling going on up there, grab your hairdryer. If you grab a tissue at this point, you're just taking the paint away. Might look all right, might not, um, but I would grab a hairdryer instead and that will stop back runs, that will... Um, uh, resolve any issues. Having said that, again, we're going to put another layer on it. So if this layer doesn't look fantastic, don't worry, we're going to glaze another layer on top um, next week. Wow, it is 11.51. I am so glad I said that I was going to split this up into two sections because I'm uh, stunned at how long uh, this has taken. You have all been extraordinary to hang around. Um, you've all given me fantastic thumbs up. I can't thank you enough. It was really exciting to log on and find that people had given me thumbs up before it began. That is like the best message to send to other people to say, um, oh, thank you, Karen. That's so wonderful. It's the best message you can send to other people to say that this is worth watching and then I get encouraged and then I want to do it more. Thank you, Jasmine. I appreciate you saying that. And um, then I'll keep doing it. That's, that's I find that uh, it was really, really satisfying putting together the painting. And I've tried today to make this version here a little different to last week's version. There's something quite lovely about oh, that way, Marion. I'm <laughs> It's backwards. The screen is backwards. So when I move one way, the screen goes, oh, 11 out of 10. I'm gonna, I love that one. That's so cool. Um, next week we will glaze another. Graciela says thank you. And Catherine says great. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. The Next week we will glaze another layer on top. I think this will work out quite nice, nicely because what it will mean is that you'll have time to get together your blade and your piece of acetate and Deb gave some suggestions about acetate and uh, or you recycle something or you know find a piece of thick plastic that will work as well. I'm going to show you um, a couple of things. You saw my cutting mat that was really really handy. Thank you uh, thank you Joan that's wonderful and Janice and James how cool is that? I'm searching for my stencil because I'm going to give you a good idea of what the stencil looks like, the one that I actually used. There it is. So the beauty of this stencil is I'm going to bring back my black mat because that's going to make it. Um, thanks, Mary. It's Sue Bound and logged under James. Oh, thanks, Sue. Wonderful. I'm going to show you on the black mat because hopefully you'll be able to see it. If I turn it on an angle, hmm, that's maybe kind of like there. Oh, right. Excellent. See how I have cut out the um, shape of the butterfly. Now what I was focusing on, I'll just use this image. Thanks, Dev. Um, this one was the royalty free one from 123 RF, royalty free. And what I did was focus on that shape, that shape, that shape, that shape. And I started on the bottom as well. I could so add more and I'll just show you what I did. Thanks, Amanda. So cool. Um, if I hold this on here, I'll see if you can see. This is what we'll be doing next week. We'll make a stencil. It will be the perfect size for your butterfly. Can I turn it on an angle and make you see the... Yeah, I'll stick my finger in it. That hole there matches that hole there. And then I just used a sponge. Oh, I should have added that to the list. But you could take it off with a bit of um, just a wet brush if you felt like it. Sponge and tissues. Sponge just makes it a lot faster and you can press hard. Actually, the more I think about a sponge is perfect. 
any sort of sponge does it. I've made a YouTube video. So I recorded myself um, creating this one. And if I um, get enough time to edit it, because I've got a whole stack of things I'm editing and releasing on YouTube at the same time. If I get to edit it, you'll see that I actually use what I had on hand was one of those um, brushes that you use the bath, you clean the bathroom surface with. Naturally, I hadn't cleaned the bathroom with it. I only use it for art, but it um, removes easily. Uh, any sort of sponge will work, a sea sponge, a kitchen sponge, um, but a sponge is completely awesome. And then I did the black while that layer was lovely and damp. And if you like that fuzzy look on those edges, that's what you'll do. I did the antennae last. And you can see on this one that I changed. <laughs> it's so weird that that's back to front. You can see on this one I changed directions. And I'm going to find that more satisfying when I look at these later on and go, well, that was a good risk. I wonder if... I like that um, direction because I just think it does always look so good or was it actually better this way? We won't know till the very end. So next week, next layer of phthalo, a little bit of lifting out with the stencil and um, and then some, I just, <laughs> I'm pointing down here, it's off screen, and negatively painting uh, the flowers in uh, which is glazing and negatively painting at the same time. So many techniques in these, this one painting. Uh, now, are there any other final questions? Oh, there was one other thing I wanted to say, and that is I'm going to now, because this is going so well, I'm going to purchase some software. And that software will allow me to um, show my face, though I'm not sure that I will, but it will allow me to. But it also will allow me to show um, other images. So I'll be able to have up on the screen the image that I was drawing from or the book that I'm working from, and um, it allows two screens, whereas the basic software that I'm using at the moment doesn't allow that. Having said that, that software also allows me to interview people. Now, we know that lockdown is going to go for a possibly another three weeks. Next week, we'll finish this butterfly. And I'm wondering whether or not we could turn the following week into something where if you were willing um, to show your art and be asked about it, as in, do you want feedback? Do you want, um, I'm just... Um, Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Amanda. Did I say thank you to Amanda already? Uh, it will allow me to give feedback online. I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or, or a bad thing. Um, because <laughs> what if I stuff up? So oh, I'm unsure about whether or not to, I'm going to interview people in that way for feedback. But you might be like, oh, that sounds absolutely brilliant. So this live um, stream is about to end and in the comments below if you feel that you would like some online feedback or if you feel that you would like to be um, uh, interviewed because it's so interesting when you look at other people's um, setup I could interview people for their setup I could interview people for um, their palettes their, their, oh, there's a thousand things that uh, I could ask this new software allows me to interview people and I've kind of been toying with the ideas of, oh, what, what kind of things will I do with it? And it just may be that all I do is show you in a screen up the top uh, the image that I'm working on. Anyway, that's going to be my next um, investment. I cannot thank you enough for your um, encouragement and for liking the live stream and for turning up this morning. It turns out Thursday mornings is an awesome thing. That's one of the things that uh, Liz wrote at the beginning that she's really looking forward to Thursday mornings and I love that. Me too. I'm really surprised at how I'm like, oh, cool, that's what I do now on Thursday mornings. I don't go and teach somewhere else. I teach here. And thank you so much. See you all next week. Bye. I'm trying to find my mouse. It fell on the ground earlier. Okay. Bye.